Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Happy Monday. <laughs> Welcome to Money Mondays with Melissa. I am so excited for those that were able to join us on today. Um, certainly, this is a great and exciting panel where we are focusing on connecting our young people with career opportunities in the financial services industry. It is certainly great to be back with you on Money Mondays with Melissa. Um, we've experienced the holidays and the new year, and now we're jumping back into the swing of things. So really looking forward to our series going forward. You know, really, we started Money Mondays with Melissa last spring. Oh my gosh, it is almost a year that we have been in this pandemic. And really when we started Money Mondays, the pandemic was at its worst. And so many of our residents and small businesses were hurting. And we thought that this Money Mondays with Melissa would be important to provide resources to help residents and small business owners. Well, now it's almost a year later. Can you believe it? I, I, I certainly can't. And Unfortunately, the pandemic is not over. Um, I'm not sure I would have believed it if someone told me that we would be here a year later, still struggling with the pandemic and with so many Chicagoans affected, especially black and brown communities and so many jobs that have been lost, lives that have been lost. Things are very different now. We can, but I'm excited that we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. We have vaccines and more and more people are getting vaccinated each day. Chicagoans, I have seen it, have come together like the community we are to protect one another through masks and social distancing, because we know that the only way we'll get through this is by working together. I'm certainly pleased to see that the positivity rate continues to decline, and let's hope that that continues. And, and so I really wanna thank everyone for what they have done up to this point to help bring down the positivity rate for COVID-19. And we certainly look forward to more and more people getting vaccinated and continuing to work in that regard. Now, today, we're here to talk about our young people, which always puts a smile on my face. Um, certainly young people have had a unique experience over the last year because they've been forced to shrink their worlds right at the time that they would normally be expanding their horizons and forging new frontiers in their lives. But we're not going to stop talking about their future and looking for new opportunities for young people because we want them to come out of this ready for what's next. We don't want them to fall behind. We want them to be ahead. So as the city treasurer of Chicago, I'm always looking for ways to bring more young talent into the financial services industry. And you'll hear from our panel today, it is a very lucrative industry. I'm especially looking for black and brown youth who are dramatically underrepresented in the financial services industry. Asset management firms, there's just a, a few facts for you. Asset management firms owned by white men manage a stunning 98.7% of the $69 trillion managed by the U.S. asset management industry. Did you hear me say $69 trillion? And white men manage a stunning 98.7% of that. Wow. That's very alarming, isn't it? 88% of senior fund managers are white and junior positions are more than 70% white. Now, these are very alarming numbers that I deal with and, and really interact with on a daily basis as city treasurer of Chicago, which is why this panel today is so very important. And this will be one of many. 
Now, there are a couple of problems with that imbalance that I just mentioned, those two points. First, when an industry does not represent the world that we live in, that tends to indicate that there is systemic racism at play. Second, firms that employ underrepresented asset managers have been shown to outperform those that don't, which means that lack, firms that lack diversity are costing their clients money. I want to make certain that I repeat that and rephrase that. So firms that employ black and brown asset managers have shown to outperform firms that do not. And so those that may be listening, please understand that firms that lack diversity are costing their clients money because diversity pays off is what statistics show us. Now, that really, I guess, answers the question as to why everyone should care about diversity because diversity, the lack of it costs money. So as city treasurer, I managed the city's portfolio, your money, taxpayers' money, of over eight and a half billion dollars of an investment portfolio. And that last point of costing money really concerns me because as a black woman born in Inglewood, raised on the west side of Chicago, who did not know much about the financial services industry as a young person, that first point really concerns me. Our neighborhoods are full of smart, ambitious young people who deserve the opportunity to learn about every career available to them and the professional support to make those careers a reality. That's why we're here today to have this conversation. I'm excited for you to meet our panelists. And first, I would like to turn it over to Craig Slack, who will moderate the conversation on today. Craig Slack, for those that have not met him as of yet, he is the Chief Investment Officer within the City Treasurer's Office. And Craig certainly knows the industry and is really well equipped with moderating this conversation today. You'll be happy to know that Craig, being the Chief Investment Officer um, in, within the City of Chicago Treasurer's Office, um, he left Wall Street, so certainly he has the experience, he has the expertise, but he left Wall Street to come with us and join the public sector so that he could be of service to underserved communities. And we're so happy to have him and certainly happy to have his perspective at this time, Craig Slack. Uh, th thank you, Madam Treasurer. It's, uh, it's always an honor to share the stage with you for sure. Uh, and you're too kind, but yes, um, I did spend the better part of three decades um, in, a, in an institutional fixed income sales role at two different global investment banks. And what that means is that I served as the distribution arm for the products and services that those firms were both creating and positioning. But, but really where I was, I had stopped growing and I really needed a change. And I, I always knew that I had a set of muscles that I wanted to flex on the buy side of the business. And I think you know, that, those two things kind of you know, allowed us to meet each other at the exact right time. Um, at the end of the day, being handed the opportunity to have direct oversight uh, of a $9 billion investment portfolio as the chief investment officer of the third largest city in the country, um, and then to also serve as an advisor to you and your role as a trustee on all four of the city's pension funds was, uh, was, uh, was just too good of an opportunity to pass up. And, and my goal when I started uh, almost two years ago was to bring my private sector experience to the public sector and really change the perception of how the city of Chicago was viewed as both an asset manager and also as the uh, as the steward of taxpayers' dollars. Um, and so far, the feedback uh, has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, but as you point out, you know what you're spelling out is that we have an incredibly unique platform that allows us to really drive impact for the citizens of the city uh, and also to create uh, social return on investment. Madam Treasurer, you have obviously uh, prioritized diversity, equity, and inclusion as the key tenet of your administration. And I know how passionate you are about reaching the city's youth and, uh, and creating pathways for them to gain exposure to the financial services industry. Um, you know, that's why I'm incredibly honored to be um, moderating today's discussion. I was uh, just thinking about how amazing this panel is. Um, let me make some introductions. Joining us today, 
uh, are Leo Harmon, uh, Senior Managing Director at Mezzo, Mesero Equity Management, Greg Williams, uh, Senior Managing Director, Partner, uh, and Co-Head of the Chicago Office of Wellington Management. We have Sydney Dillard, Partner uh, and Head of Corporate Investment Banking at Loop Capital Markets. And last but not least, we have Bevan uh, Joseph, who is co-founder of the Greenwood Project here in Chicago. Welcome everyone, it's great to have you and thank you all for being here. Um, we, we have a lot that we wanna cover, so let's just dive right in. Uh, I'd like to kick things off by asking each, each of you to tell us brief, briefly about your organizations and what your firms do. Leo, why don't you get us started today? Um, thank you, Craig, and um, thank you, Madam Treasurer, for having us here to address these important issues. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I did want to take a brief moment before we get started to uh, address the uh, wave of violence that's been inflicted upon our um, various members of the Asian American and specific island community. Uh, I know we're here today to discuss um, specific remedies for uh, and for specific uh, um, grievances, but there's a general level of discrimination that I think impacts all of us. And I think I can speak for our panelists and, uh, and our firm that we stand in solidarity and support of um, our Asian American and Pacific Island brothers and sisters um, as they have been um, the victims of this targeted hate. Um, talk a little bit about Mesero. Um, our uh, firm uh, provides business primarily in three areas, uh, capital markets and investment banking, um, advisory services, which um, deals directly with um, pension funds, 401k plans, and individuals, and then my group, which is in global investment management, um, which provides um, opportunities for um, addressing the needs of um, institutional investors um, across a wide variety of products, including um, equities, alternatives, and, and, and real estate. Th thank you, Leo. Greg? Great. And good afternoon, everyone. And, and Madam Treasurer Craig, thank you so much for having me participate on this panel. You know, the, the work that you've been doing with the Treasurer's Office has been critical to, to everything that's happening in the city. And I think, you know, the support that you've shown through Mondays with, with Melissa, you know, really stands out given the, the, the challenging environment we've all been living through. So, so thank you for your efforts. Um, so just to speak quickly about Wellington Management Company. So we're an investment management firm. We manage close to $1.3 trillion in assets under management right now. Um, and if you think of our platform, we have capabilities across equities, fixed income, hedge funds, private equity, commodities, so a range of different asset classes that we invest in. We've got around 2,300 clients spread across the globe, I think about 60 countries or so across the globe, personnel here in North America, in EMEA, and in Asia. And I'd say most importantly um, for, for today in the audience today, you know, we've had the pleasure of having a Chicago office for the past 20 or so years and the privilege of working with many public funds, corporations, nonprofits, insurance companies in the Chicago area and across the state. And ultimately, you know, our overall goal at Wellington is to meet and exceed the investment and service expectations of our clients. So, so just know that that's something we're striving to do on a daily basis. Thank you, Greg. Sydney? Thank you, Craig. Really appreciate the opportunity um, to be on this panel today. Thank you guys for hosting it and, and with the focus that we have for the discussion. I'm Sydney Dillard and I'm a partner, um, as Craig said, and head of corporate investment banking at Loop Capital Markets. We are um, so um, you know, thrilled and proud um, to be among the largest privately held investment banks in the country. We are predominantly um, African-American owned um, and Melissa, and you, as you know, our, our chairman, our CEO, and our co-founder hails from Inglewood as well, um, and very proudly so. Um, but we are, we're focused um, as a firm on helping our, our clients raise capital, and that's both um, our public fund clients and other units of government, as well as our corporate clients. Uh, we help our corporate clients raise capital, both in the bond market, the fixed income market, as well as the equity markets. We do both public and private capital raising. Um, we work with our clients from an advisory perspective um, as well. Um, on the corporate side, which is the area that I focus in on around buy side and sell side um, advisory assignments, um, we do sales and trading um, in the equity markets as well as in the fixed income markets um, and really kind of a broad array of, of ways that we serve our clients. Uh, leveraging the investment that we've made in our resources. We're about 215 people 
um, on our platform and we are uh, now in our 24th year um, uh, as a firm. So super excited to be here and to talk more about this topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney. Bhavan? Yeah, thanks a lot, Greg. And um, thanks, Madam Treasurer, for having me today. I'm happy to be here with these uh, distinguished panelists. Um, my name is Bhavan Joseph. I am the co-founder of the Greenwood Project. We're based here in Chicago. Started in 2016 by myself and my wife. You know, we both spent 20 years in uh, on Wall Street. I was in New York. She's from Chicago. But uh, we started the organization because we had uh, realized internships themselves had become a privilege at a lot of firms. I met so many interns over the years. I managed a lot of them, but they all seem to be related to or connected to somebody at that firm, right? So we started with five students who were uh, kids of friends of ours. I had a full-time job. I was a CTO at a hedge fund. My wife was at a prop shop and never in a million years, we thought we'd be running a nonprofit five years later. But those five students have turned into 350. Four partnerships with four firms in Chicago have turned into about 45 all across the country and even in London. So our students come from the south and west sides of Chicago, from um, communities that don't get a look from downtown, right? We, we realize and we say, you know, there's no lack of talent. What there is is a lack of opportunity and exposure. And kids can't be what they can't see, right? So we found a way to help firms and help, for, and help see, uh, kids as well, high school and college, find internships when they get to college. They have an internship pretty much every summer with us. We had 40 college kids last year. We'll have 86 this year. We had 40 high school kids last year. We'll have 70 this year. And there'll be in, uh, the, the college kids will be in multiple cities. But we exist because you know, our students just don't know. They're smart, they're talented, they're ambitious, they're eager to learn, they're coachable. What they don't have is a network. So our job at Greenwood is to help them grow their social capital, to get connected, get access to the opportunities at financial firms. And we've had a lot of success. We'll dig into that a little bit later, but um, just happy to be here and to, to share my input with the panel. Thank you, thank you so much, Bhavan. Um, let, let's shift a little bit to breaking down the barriers. Um, as I think about it, there are literally thousands of ways for young people to get into the business. Uh, you're all very successful professionals at well-respected institutions, but we all had to start somewhere, right? Let's talk about both your personal journeys and maybe that of your organizations. And I'd also like to discuss some of the obstacles you faced and, and perhaps still face on the path to where you are today. Um, Bevan, why don't you uh, maybe start out on this topic? Yeah, definitely. So um, as you can hear from my, uh, my accent, I'm not from Chicago. I was born in a little small island in the Caribbean called Trinidad and Tobago. But I moved uh, after high school to, to the New York area, and I spent 20, uh, 20 years of my life there. But my very first job was on the floor of Chase um, in Manhattan, and it was on a trading floor. And I had no idea what was going on. People were yelling, cursing, screaming. And I was just like intrigued by the environment and I got close to some traders. I was like, what's going on here? I was actually a technology guy fixing computers on a trading floor. And, but I was obsessed with the environment. I wanted to learn more. So I really um, just, you know, set out to have, um, to learn as much as I can about the, the, the industry. And again, worked my way all the way up to a CTO at a hedge fund here in Chicago 20 years later. But, you know, my journey was, um, pretty much the journey of a lot of our students at Greenwood now. I wanted to now be the person who could tell them what was going on at the, on that trading floor, could tell them about Chase and Morgan Stanley and all these firms. So I have never had a career outside of financial services up until starting this nonprofit. But I think um, one thing I've realized is there's so many young people out there that, again, if given the opportunity to expand, in, you know, they can really excel and do well. Um, you know, and going to have a lucrative, uh, successful career. So um, some of the challenges I faced along the way was trying to figure it out myself. You know, I, I look back and think about what would have happened to me? Where would I be now if I knew somebody in the business or somebody to say, hey, check this out or I'll go to this particular degree or whatever that is, just having mentors in the, in the industry. I did gain mentors along the way, but I think, um, you know, I wouldn't change a thing really looking back because I think it helped me get where I am today. And but I want to be the person on the trading floor now to help that young person from the south and west sides of Chicago say, let me help you. Let me hold your hand a little bit. Let me give you all the resources that uh, will help you uh, be successful, you know, and really change the trajectory of your life. All our kids that we work with are first generation. You know, I take kids from Chicago and take them to New York for a full week on Wall Street. Those kids have never been on a plane before, right? So I think about all the stuff that I had to figure out on my own, but I now want to become that resource 
you know, that, that, that organization that can really uh, amplify that message and, and help kids realize that there's a lot more outside of their community. Yeah, uh, Bev Bevan, I know that, uh, that your students are thankful for your journey, certainly. Um, Cindy, what are your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so it, it's interesting, Bavan. I really, you know, have great appreciation for what your organization is doing because one of the reasons that I ended up in banking was because of a program called SEO, Sponsors for Educational Opportunity, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And, um, you know, a wonderful man by the name of Mike Oshowitz, you know, decided that he would start SEO. It was probably, I think I must have been in maybe the second or third class um, of folks, but he started on the East Coast. I uh, went to Stanford undergrad and the first time that he came, he, the, he came out to Stanford for the very first time and I was able to be a part, selected to be a part of the program and that really gave me my exposure to Wall Street because I was looking for a summer internship and, um, and they were looking for minority students. And so it does make a difference, um, you know, in terms of those kinds of programs and the access um, that it provides um, and exposure. Um, and so that really was the launching off point for me to really you know, start and have interest in a, a career in financial services, which I ultimately did once I un finished undergrad, I, you know, um, was selected to be a part of a training program. I started my career at Northern Trust Bank and then really kind of continued along that journey, um, discovered that I liked being on the corporate and institutional side of the business. And so really explored different ways to be able um, to do that. You know, I think in terms of, you know, where we are now, um, in terms of, me from a, as a professional, as well as Loop as a, as a firm. I remember when I first came to Loop um, in 2002, so it was in about five years in for the firm. Um, you know, Jim had started this firm, it was really gonna be focused on municipal sales and trading and public finance. And I came as a part of helping to grow out, you know, what it is that we would do and how we would work with our corporate clients given my background, you know, but it was interesting because it's not easy to get opportunities, right? Like people are not waiting for us to show up so that we can do business together. And so, you know, that was really an awakening, you know, for me in terms of how you can be so well regarded in one place. And then, you know, it's looked at very differently when you're in another place. And I think that's the piece that has been, you know, quite enlightening, right? Because, you know, we've got great people on our platform who are very experienced, um, you know, in financial services and from Wall Street, but then, you know, you, you take, bring your talent to another platform and then you get questioned, right? Or, you know, the credibility doesn't come with you and you've got to rebuild that and you've got to, um, you know, and create that um, again in, in the marketplace. And I think that's one of the things that, you know, we continue to, um, to run up against, but I, you know, I'm really proud of, you know, one, the fact that we are, are thought leaders um, and that we are at the table having those conversations. And we've certainly seen a lot more of that um, in the past year in terms of folks who are willing to, uh, really willing to have authentic discussions about, you know, thinking out of the box and not having to operate in the same old constructs that we've seen. And so we are taking the opportunity to really drive through that um, as much as possible so that essentially it ends up just being how people think about doing business, right? It's not just how we think about doing business because, you know, we were all still and we were able to see that George Floyd was murdered, right? It was, it's just becomes a way that we do business together and how it is that we invite people to the table um, for opportunities. Thank you, Sydney. Uh, Greg, uh, I know your story is a little bit different in how you got uh, your start. Why don't you, why don't you tell us about it? Yes, they, to, to say the least, Craig, it's definitely been a journey and, and definitely a non-traditional background for somebody that's gotten in the, into the investments business. But, but I think in some ways, you know, I'm, I'm the test case for why people, you know, from, from different backgrounds can participate in this industry. And so if we can keep it amongst our group, I mean, I actually started out out of undergrad as, as an actor. And so that's what actually brought me to <laughs> Chicago as I, I was acting for a couple of years. And by that, I mean, you know, did a lot of auditioning, but also waited a lot of tables and did a lot of temping along the way too. That's how we kept the lights on, you know, at that point in time. Um, uh, you know, then I went on to do a series of roles in more marketing and communications in the sports and entertainment industry. So I worked for the Cubs, you know, for a summer and then moved out to Oregon and went to work for Nike for a couple of years, moved down to LA to work for a talent literary agency there. And somewhere along the way, you know, I, I started to just talk to some of my friends and, and people that I knew who had worked 
in investment banking or investment management or were traders. And I had no clue what they were talking about or what they were doing. You know, I had no real you know, idea of how the economy functioned or how markets function. Um, but, you know, for whatever reason, I just started to take an interest in the business and in the industry and started to study and, and, and really started to read a lot of books and periodicals on, on what we do in the industry. And so for me, it was clearly a significant career shift where I had to learn a new language, basically. I had to develop technical skills. I had to develop a new network. And then also I had to convince people that I could ultimately carry the tune in order to do that, you know, for me to make my first step into the business. I ended up going to the University of Chicago for business school where I got some of that, the technical skills that allowed me to become a participant in the industry. And then along that journey, you know, somewhat similar to what Sydney was saying, you know, I became a Twigo Foundation fellow and they were very supportive and, and exposing me to the industry, exposing me to companies in our industry. Also was a part of NBA Jumpstart, which is an organi organization that's somewhat similar. And, and so I raise all that to say, I mean, you can clearly start in one spot in your life early on uh, and, and end up somewhere else and do it successfully. But I, I would just tell the, the young folks on the line that it's going to take hustle. It's going to take dedication um, in order to develop a foundation to do whatever you want to do. It could be the financial service industry or, or, or somewhere else. Um, but the key thing is you're building this foundation and this base of knowledge and this skill set so you can enter conversations with confidence feel as if you're bringing something to the table um, that, that that's a value. And ultimately, you know, once you can prove yourself, you can have an impact in, in a business like the financial services industry, you know, which, which, you know, as, as Madam Treasurer mentioned earlier today, you know, has significant, you know, impact across global markets and across the economy. And so you, you may feel as if you're starting one place today, but trust me, if I could do it, you can certainly make the transition yourself. That's great, Greg. And we'll talk about your IMBD page after the meeting. So uh, thank you. Um, but uh, Leo, you and I have only known each other for a short time, but it, it, it's funny how quickly we did connect. I mean, we have so many, you know, common friends. It's, I'm just constantly reminded about how small this business is. Uh, really excited to hear about your story. Absolutely. Um, I grew up um, on the south side of Chicago from West Inglewood, uh, raised by a single mother. Uh, so statistically, I'm not supposed to be here, right? Uh, at least that's what the, the odds say. So, you know, my biggest message to a lot of the, the, the younger folks out there is don't listen to statistics. I eat them for lunch now. Um, I used to watch this guy on TV named Andrew Leckie when I was a kid. I used to stay up late to watch the news, and he was the economist investment guy. And knew I always wanted to be in banking and finance or something but never knew what kind of field I wanted to get into, never even knew these sort of things existed um, until I got an internship at college at uh, Caterpillar and just happened to be placed in their investment management unit where I learned a lot about um, building a business, investing in stocks, um, and then went on to grad school um, and actually started my career on the fixed income side of the business, managing mortgage-backed securities and wanted to come back to the equity side moved back to Chicago, uh, called over 100 people to get 10 phone calls back, to get three interviews, to get two job offers. And, and so when Bev, Bevan talks about networks and pipelines, uh, those were the types of things that I had to do just to get one job uh, in those days. So it's, it's, it's tremendously important for our youth today to understand how to build a network, how to work with folks um, like Bavon in order to matriculate through this industry um, because it's not very giving. Um, and, and you do need mentors, you do need networks and you do need help and support. Um, I was ultimately hired by a minority owned firm called the Kenwood Group, which ironically was one of the first customers of Loop Capital um, back when they were uh, a fledgling organization. And so, you know, my roots in the investment management community have always been here. And, and, and I think it's really important for young folks to understand that, you know, while the journey is hard, it, it's, it's, it's certainly not impossible. That's great, Leo. Thank, thank you so much. Um, Bavon, um, let's shift a little bit. You know, the treasurer and I hear all the time, uh, you know, organizations are telling us we, we just can't find diverse talent. And I know how much that makes the treasurer bristle. 
Uh, talk about that misconception and the importance of introducing black and brown students to the financial services industry, would you please? Makes me bristle too, Craig. Uh, um, you know, when I hear that, I, I tell a lot of firms in daily conversations and even from day one when Green was started, I said, don't assume that everybody wants to work for you. Don't assume that everybody knows who you are, right? So a lot of firms say, well, we go recruit from the same schools that you guys have find kids. How come you could find the diverse candidates and we can't? I said, well, the population we serve, they don't come to career fairs because they don't know who you are. They don't have a suit. They don't have a resume. Nobody's taught them how to network. It's like, that, that's who I'm looking for, right? Most firms are fishing out of the same pond. They have a target list of schools they're going after, and then they complain that they can't find any talent. I said, you have to do something different if you want to look different. You got to go find students in a different place. Over 50% of our 2021 classes from our HBCUs state schools as well, like real tiny schools that nobody really gives a look to. And uh, when I talk to firm, talk to students, I say, hey, this is, these are the logos of all the firms we're working with. Well, you might, they might recognize one of those 50, but the rest of them is like, we have no idea who these firms are. Like, why should we be interested? And that's why we start building our pipeline from the junior year in high school, not college. Because if you wait for these students till when they get to college, it's too late. So our high school juniors and seniors they visit a different company every single day for six weeks during the summer. The reason for that is we want to take them to Mesero and William Blair and all these firms so they can meet Leo and others, right? Because what even um, is even more important is that they see people who look like themselves doing this. Like that's what really, that's one of the big, biggest challenges is our young people just don't know that the industry is for them. They assume or they see what they see on TV or whatever. It's just they, they don't see themselves represented, right? And that alone is a big challenge. The number one concern I have for my students every year is how do I be myself at work? Will there be somebody there who, who looks like me? Right? So we partner a lot with employee resource groups and stuff like that. So when we find the talent and bring them to the doorstep of these firms and we train them as well, those employee resource groups put their arms around them and make them feel welcome and retain them. But I see it every day. There is no lack of talent, like I said. We have a waiting list. We'll have 86 college kids working this summer we probably have another 50 that we can't find places for. These kids are out there. These are kids from all over the country, not just Chicago anymore. We recently, um, I, I met Leo a couple months ago. Somebody introduced us. We had a great conversation and now we're partners, right? They'll have a, a, a bunch of uh, Greenwood interns, right? And I think the important thing too is, is connecting with people like Leo and others who get it, right? Our students are not coming into your firm to like crush it in investment banking in the first internship. That's not gonna happen. Because the problem we're trying to address uh, is one of a lack of opportunity, education, exposure, that's generations in the making, right? And to undo all that, it's not a one season, it's not a one recruiting season fix, right? You, um, you start with these kids, we start with them when they're juniors in high school, they were like five or six summers there with us and they end up in a career down the road. 75% uh, of our college grads have gone to full-time roles in Chicago and New York, working at firms now they had never heard of before. Moving from Roseland to New York, to work on the sales and trading desk of Piper Sandler. Yeah, that, had, that, that young man right now, he's like, I, I feel like I hit the lotto. I, I, this changes everything. His little brother wants to be like him now, right? So that's the change, right? And this is expensive work. It takes a long time. So a lot of firms have been impatient in the past. 2020 was a huge year for us, you know, with um, the Black Lives Matter movement. A lot of firms came to us. They're still calling us today. You know, we want to help, we want to help, we want to help. I said, if you're serious about helping, partner with us for the next five years, right? Show how serious you are about this because that's how long it might take for this young person to get to your firm and get through the interview process on their own, right? Because we need them for a couple of summers. We need firms to open up their doors. So to answer your question, there's really, trust me, there's no lack of talent out there. I am seeing it all the time. They might need a little more handholding initially, but they get up to speed really quickly. Right, the challenge that they have is that, um, and the industry has, I think, is the industry is assuming that everybody wants to work for them, like I said. But sometimes it starts with just educating the young people about who the firms are, what the roles are, and, and matching, doing some matchmaking to help them understand what it means to get in there. Great, great color, Bhavan. Um, Leo, you know, I think about it, Mesro Financial has been part of the Chicago financial landscape since 1937. You know, tell us what types of roles you're looking to fill at Mesro, whether it be on the asset management side or the brokerage side of the house. And more specifically, what kind of skill set are you looking to, uh, for in a prospective client candidate? 
And as you know, we have at Mesro, we we have over 15 different business units, and so we're we're always looking for various positions across all of those units, anywhere from accounting to finance to marketing, um, uh, financial analysts, where we require MBAs and CFAs, um, and even business development folks um, who who are going to go out and sell product for us. And so we're always looking at those sorts of people who have a variety of skill sets. Um, that we think can fill those positions. I think the biggest thing for us is, you know, how do we change the dynamic? You know, going back to Bavon's point of, you know, we can't find enough talent. You know, what we wanted to do is really try to change how we uh, address those issues and those needs in the marketplace. So one of the things that we did is we combined our office of recruiting um, with our head of diversity, equity, and inclusion into the same person and into the same office so that we can now leverage and have synergy and have direct responsibility in both our recruiting and in our DEI policy. So now not only the policies don't stand alone in a in an HR silo, they're actually being applied um, to a recruitment network. And then that combined effort is deliberate and it's intentional um, in, in driving a, a new pipeline for us. Um, the other thing is that we've done is we've created specific programs, particularly in traditional investment management that have been um, um, traditionally underrepresented by um, Black and Latinx and Indigenous communities, where in our analyst rotational programs, we seek out those individuals um, with the hope that they would matriculate through a, a two-year program and end up um, with a job at Mesero at the end of that. And then as Bavon mentioned, now creating our own pipelines, partnering with like-minded organizations where we can create internships that hopefully turn into permanent jobs. And so I think you need all of these things. Um, the biggest thing that we talk about is doing this at every level of the organization. So if you only do this at the entry level, it's gonna take you 20 years before your, your work community reflects your overall community that you're trying to serve. You have to do this at lower level management, you have to do it at middle management, and you have to do it at upper level management. You have to have diverse slates of candidates for every job that you have in your organization. And if you make the funnel big enough at the top, what comes out at the bottom is gonna look like the diversity that you put into the top. So all of that to say that, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of things at Mesero and, 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 and I'm sure a lot of other organizations are as well, where we're trying to create our own pipeline so that we can address this issue of not finding enough talent or not having enough talent. Thank you so much, Leo. I, I you know, I've heard a, a little bit about your, your story and what you're trying to accomplish. It's really great stuff. Um, Greg, same question for you and Wellington Management. Your firm is doing some amazing things here in Chicago. I know, um, I know Wellington has several initiatives that are helping create pathways for young people from underrepresented populations. Can you take a minute to, to kind of answer that same question, please? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think what Bavon and Leo are saying is so powerful, right? It's about how do you create this ecosystem where we're providing opportunity and access to the industry. And, and I think, you know, as, as firms, hopefully we can all work together to get there. But as I think about, you know, specific things related to Wellington, um, you know, Craig, you started out, you know, with one question of just kind of who are we looking for and the qualities that we're looking for. And again, I think to Bavon's point, you know, I, I think increasingly we broaden the scope on the types of candidates that, that we're considering. We broaden the scope on where we're seeking out talent as well. So to me, you know, personally, it's, you know, trying to find people who are intellectually curious, who are passionate, who are humble, we're a very team oriented, collaborative environment. So, so having a level of humility and also a sense of humor is, is something that I'd say is important. Um, I also think having the right attitude and aptitude to want to learn and to dig into the subject matter is something that's important. And then lastly, I mean, we, we've got a big fiduciary responsibility, all the firms on the line right now, right, of taking care of our clients' assets. So finding people who are act, gonna act with integrity, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I think is something that, that's key. So, so if I think about some of the structural things that we're doing at Wellington, to hopefully again, provide more access to our firm and to the industry for people from underrepresented backgrounds. I think on the structural side, you know, we've got a chief diversity officer, her name's Shauna Ferguson. If you get a chance to meet her, she's a really dynamic person and she's been really driving, you know, our, our, our program when it comes to diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, we've got a diversity, equity and inclusion committee. We've got a series of business networks. And I know we might talk a little bit about that later on in the conversation. So from a structural perspective, there's a lot going on at the firm to ensure that we're positioning ourselves 
um, for success, you know, as we try to evolve, evolve our own profile. Um, you know, when I think about attracting talent and potential opportunities, you know, we, as we've all been talking about, I think people need exposure to this industry earlier on in their lives, earlier on in their careers. And so we do have early career programs for people across investing, across the business side of, of, of things at Wellington, across our investment science operation, across operations, across IT. And so these early career programs um, are focused on attracting diverse talent to, to our firm. We also have summer internships where that are open to all, but, but really with a focus on trying to find diverse talent for people at, at, at the undergrad level as well. Um, as I mentioned, we're broadening out the scope of, of where we're recruiting from. So that includes having partnerships with HBCUs and with Hispanic serving institutions as well. Um, you know, and if I think about specifically related to Chicago, you know, in our Chicago office over the past few summers, we've had interns from Chicago scholars. Um, we've also, you know, as I'm part of the Wellington Management Foundation, we support a number of organizations that are Chicago based. And so, for instance, with Chicago Jesuit, we've had a series of discussions with, with the youth that are involved in that school to talk about financial literacy and how to get involved in the industry. So, so we think the more grassroots we can take this initiative and our efforts, the, the better off we'll ultimately become. So, so to me, that's one part of the mosaic. Another part of the mosaic is being a participant in the community. And so we've mentioned a few of the organizations like the Twigo Foundation, you know, Sydney mentioned SEO, you know, Wellington just signed up to be part of the corporate call to action, which is a collection of investment management firms um, who are focused on evolving the diversity profile of the industry. And this initiative was actually started by the state of Connecticut and the Ford Foundation. So we're excited to be a part of that to really find proactive ways to effectuate change. I'd say on the investment side, um, right now we're, we're in the development stages of, of building a private equity portfolio that's going to focus on investing in diverse owned businesses and with diverse owned VC funds. And so we feel that this is an action oriented way for us to, to participate and to do something that's really in the DNA of who we are, which is, which is investing. And lastly, I'd say from a cultural perspective, you know, for us, and, and I, you know, I've been around Wellington since 2006, I've always felt as if my voice could be heard. I never felt I was held back by the color of my skin. And I think that, it, you know, is really driven by the culture that we have at our firm where we're inclusive, we value the ideas of the individual, and we work really hard to preserve that culture. And we think if we can do that, along with attracting talent, we can keep talent, you know, at Wellington and hopefully develop them to become partners of the firm over time. Thanks, Greg. And, and, and again, appreciate Wellington's commitment to Thrive Scholars as well. I know you're committed to a number of these organizations locally, so thank you. Um, Sydney, I, I was just a baby, uh, but I was in the business when your firm <laughs> got started as a as a small municipal bond yeah. shop in, yeah. in the mid 90s. Yeah, you too. Um, but but your, your firm is now one of the largest minority owned full service investment banks in the country. It's just an amazing success story. Uh, it strikes me that you might have a unique perspective as you answer that same question for Loop Capital. Um, you know, we do. And I think one of the things, you know, Jim Reynolds, um, as our, our CEO and our, our chairman and co-founder, you know, he, he talks a lot about this. He's been on CNBC and talked about the fact that we don't have a problem finding diverse talent, um, that that's not an issue. And so, you know, we're, we're always perplexed when, you know, the general marketplace says they can't find it, right? Because you just have to look in the right places, Bavon, to your point um, that you're making. I mean, when you when you look at Loop's leadership team, you know, basically a third of our leadership team are minorities or women. Um, about a third of our employee base um, is also uh, minority and women. Um, we have, you know, since literally we were, you know, smaller than a peanut, we've had an internship program at Loop. Um, and in fact, um, Courtney Gibson, you know, who's our president, um, was one of our first interns. Um, and so, you know, we know kind of what the benefit and the value is of internships. And in that time, we have had internship programs every year. Um, you know, sometimes we have increased the size of the firm by like 10 to 15% in the summer um, during the summer months to accommodate having a robust internship program um, so that we can do what we feel is our, our obligation and our pleasure to be able to introduce introduce diverse um, folks to the investment banking industry. We feel that it's our obligation to do that. Um, and we've got a great platform for doing it um, and, and having people. And we think when it's all said and done that ultimately we will have 
you know, you know, well um, above our weight class, the impact on um, black and brown uh, young people who come into this industry. And they may not all work at Loop because we, you know, we can't accommodate that. But we have a lot of people that have worked at Loop as interns who are on the street and doing great things and representing, you know, really kind of the, the foundation that we gave them um, in this business in, a, in, a, in great ways. And we continue to do that. And so, you know, on, in any given year, you know, we're getting, we're getting thousands of, you know, of applications for our internship program. You know, during this time, we've had a lot of conversations uh, with our clients who are looking um, and talking with us about best practices for attracting talent. Um, even, you know, ideas around where we might co-sponsor an intern together, you know, where they could work um, on Loop's platform for the first half of the summer, work, um, you know, with our client um, for the second half of the summer to get a broader exposure. So a lot of different constructs or even just sharing, you know, um, the, the applications um, and the talent that we're seeing with others um, for opportunities um, in the business, asset management, or, you know, otherwise with our corporate clients. So a lot of different constructs we're seeing um, that we're able to contribute to. Um, you know, we've been very active in the financial services pipeline um, effort here in Chicago that's spearheaded by um, the Chicago Fed um, and really looking to have an impact and working, you know, across all the financial services institutions in Chicago to, um, to attract talent. Um, you know, so there, I think there are a lot of opportunities to do that. What I will say is that, you know, despite, you know, all of our great efforts, you know, young people, you know, have to be persistent and you've got to really stick to it in terms of, you know, just making sure you have visibility and going after opportunities. You know, one of the things that we talked about before we started this is that there are opportunities in our business. Financial services is doing great. Um, and, you know, asset, um, you know, assets are growing. Um, if you're on the asset management side, there's a lot of transactions that are happening, a lot of capital that's being raised. If you're on the investment banking side, a lot of deals that are being done. And so, you know, we have done COVID hires um, where, you know, and this is the first time that we did it, you know, last year I added two analysts to my platform, to my division, and we did it, the, the process end to end, totally virtually. We had never done that before, but we needed talent. And we've now gone on to do that, you know, many times over as we've added folks to our platform. And so I just want to make sure that folks know that there are opportunities are out there. Um, the pandemic um, you know, may have um, impacted certain areas, but in financial services, um, it is going strong and there is a need for talent and folks should not, um, you know, uh, step, step away from um, putting themselves out there and making sure that they're in front of folks to, um, you know, to capture the opportunities that are available. Yeah, th thank you for mentioning that, Sydney. That uh, th that's that's a wonderful narrative that needs to be pushed on the on the COVID related opportunities. So thank you so much for what you're doing yep. there. Um, let me make a quick public service announcement um, as a reminder to the audience to please submit your questions. Um, in the drop down, we're gonna to try to get to those at the end of the panel discussion. Uh, and if we don't have the time, uh, we are certainly going to respond to those questions in writing. Um, Sydney, Leo, Greg, I, I know that your firms all have unwavering organizational commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, for me, making diverse hires is, you know, while important, is just one leg of the stool. Um, if you would, maybe take a few minutes to discuss your thoughts on not just hiring, but how you're looking to ensure that your diverse workforces are set up to succeed and thrive. And I'm thinking specifically about things like ERGs or affinity groups, mentoring, you know, unconscious bias training, quantitative goals towards promotion and pay. Sydney, um, uh, why don't you get us started on this one? Yeah, happy to. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, there's about a little over 200 of us um, on our platform. Uh, you know, the majority of us are, are Chicago based, um, a lot, another second majority are New York based, and then other folks throughout the country. One of the things, um, and actually COVID, I think, has, has helped this. This has been, um, you know, to really keep us more connected, maybe than we otherwise would be, because, you know, we are also facing the client and we're out. Um, you know, generating business opportunities for the firm, helping to create solutions for our clients, et cetera. And so, you know, one of the things that we've done as we've gone through this is really, you know, how it is that we help support kind of our young people or folks in the organization who are moving into new roles, who 
who've been in the organization to provide those opportunities for them um, uh, within Lou, which we are delighted to be able to do because as we started, Craig, and you talked about where we started in the mid nineties, you know, as we were starting our firm, we really needed to attract, um, you know, experienced folks, right? To like hit the ground mm -hmm. running. And then as we kind of got, you know, midway through where we are now, we really were able to then add young people and grow them and develop them on our platform. And that's what we continue to do. And I think in one of the opportunities, I think that, you know, that keep folks connected to Loop. And in fact, you know, we've been around long enough now where people, you know, have been at Loop, they may have gone back to business school or they've gone somewhere else on the street and they've actually come back um, to Loop, which is great. Um, in terms of in a real testament, I think, to the opportunity they see on our platform. But, you know, where we are trying to, I think there are opportunities that our young people get on our platform that they're not going to get on a larger uh, firm platform in terms of exposure, responsibility. Um, and that's why we, you know, we have a construct in place where we're supporting them from our training and development perspective to be best positioned for those opportunities to be able to impact revenue in an earlier period of time than they might otherwise if they were really kind of just in the, the construct in the box of the street where you know there's just a certain path and there's a timeline for that. So we've really tried to make that um, a part of how it is that we um, help folks kind of prepare for um, those opportunities that are available you know, on our platform as we move forward. You know, and one of the things that we have now, because we started the firm with most, you know, with um, very experienced people, we're also preparing for, you know, really this transition, right? Because, you know, I'm not going to work forever. And so we've got to, and we're making sure that we're getting our young people ready to move into those roles and supporting them. And we've got resources dedicated to supporting their transition into um, these more leadership roles within the organization and vis-a-vis -vis our client relationships. That's, that's great, Sydney. Um, Leo? Yeah, I think I'll just add to Sydney's comments. Uh, you know, I think part of the problem we have in this industry as a whole is that there's generally a big hole in the middle of, of, of employees. So a lot of times we're able to recruit folks and get them in through the door um, a lot of times you see folks at the top end of organizations, um, but there's a, a real difficulty in retention and promotion, uh, particularly if you talk to uh, folks like the financial services pipeline who you know, have a, a lot of statistics um, that, that highlight this. And so what we've tried to do at Mesero is, is, is create lots of different ERGs um, to help impact that problem. So I recently created DEI Council, um, Pride Connect, Women Connect um, are all various uh, ERGs that that I think help to address issues of underrepresentation um, within the workplace. But I think secondarily, what you need to have um, is not just diversity. You have to have inclusion and equity as a part of that. And, and what I mean by that is that everyone needs to be able to have equal access um, to opportunities within an organization so that you just don't have a, a, a traditional old boys club promoting the members of the old boys club throughout the organization. And there also needs to be fairness and transparency and outcomes. And so that promotions and raises and pay uh, become more equitable in that environment. And it will help you with uh, retention and promotion and, and helping build up um, diversity within your organization throughout. That's great. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, and, and so 100% agree with Leo. I, I think attracting talent is important, but also clearly retaining that talent and developing that talent over time is, is something where I think the industry can do a better job. Um, and I think, you know, at Wellington, we, we put a few really specific things in place to help us with that de development path. Number one is just training the managers to really focus on development plans for the people that they're managing. I think it really starts at a, at a really close level between the, the manager and the person that reports to in, in their direct reports. Um, we've got other organizations and committees internally at Wellington, including a group called Upstanders. And so Upstanders is a group of partners who have raised their hand to say, hey, I wanna be part of mentoring, advocating for, um, directing, helping in any way I can, individuals from diverse backgrounds at the firm. And so, you know, 
partner who's an upstander will be paired with a mentee or what we call an upstandee. And they will work together over a period of time to you know, reach whatever goal the upstandee wants to achieve um, at the end of the day. We also have developed uh, an academy, a training academy called Groundbreakers, which is really focused on individuals from diverse backgrounds that are early career, mid career, really helping them to develop their, their, their skill set. Um, and, and so that's a dedicated training academy where you apply to get accepted, you participate for a period of time, you ultimately have a capstone project to deliver um, to, the, to the broader firm. And we think that that's another way to develop talent. And then also hopefully, you know, coming out of groundbreakers, people understand the skills that they need to continue on in their career. Um, and, and, you know, senior management gets more visibility into the individuals and some of their strengths as they're going through the groundbreakers program. Um, you know, Craig, you mentioned something that's super important, right? You, you've got to be able to measure what the outcomes are. So we're developing an accountability framework related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we can actually ensure that we're tracking our progress and we're keeping track of it, uh, you know, across time. We do have other programs like unconscious bias training and a lot of other trainings that you can take online that you can take live as well. And then I think importantly, kind of in response to the George Floyd incident and other situations of racial injustice last year, you know, partners who don't come from, you know, black heritage, you know, a lot of people were raising their hands saying, what can I do to help and how can I get educated? And one thing that the folks in the black community said was, you know, we're happy to educate you, but you know, there's a lot, this is a very stressful time. And so what, what other people did was they raised their hand and said, all right, I'm gonna take up the initiative to educate myself and to learn on my own. And so a group has been developed called Becoming Allies of people who are in the majority learning about black history, learning about unconscious bias. There's a consistent kind of reading group and book club that's happening within that community as well. And so again, people have taken the onus on themselves to really educate themselves about some of the challenges that black people have faced over time. Um, and then lastly, we, we talked a little bit about just, uh, you know, business networks. We've got a, a series of call it 13 to 15 business networks at our firm. So like Shades, I'm part of Shades, which is an employee resource group dedicated to people from black heritage. We've got Conexiones for the Latinx population. So depending on kind of what population you come from and where you want to participate, and you don't have to be black to be in shades. There are plenty of people that are white mm -hmm. that are in shades, but you know, these groups are available um, for support and, and also just you know, to ensure that, that people from a common background do have some, some folks that look like them to interact with on a consistent basis. Yeah, th thank you, Greg. And you know, all your comments are, are outstanding. All your firms are thought leaders in this space. So thank you for what you're doing. Um, and the narrative is just great to continue to push. Um, Bevan, let me, let me circle back to you. And, and, you know, the Greenwood Project is such an amazing organization and you're just getting started. You know, I'm so intrigued by your model. You're, you're looking to get students who are younger and likely have never been exposed to the industry. What, what, are, these kids, what, what are these kids need uh, to do and where do they go to get started? Uh, and maybe, you know, talk a little bit about the importance of feeding that financial services pipeline, please. Yeah, definitely, Craig. And, uh, you know, what's interesting about our model is we've been able to grow so quickly because students have become our biggest ambassadors. So they go back to school. They go back to college and high school. I find myself at several high schools or colleges on a weekly basis. I'm still doing that virtually at student organized events. I'm not being invited by principals or teachers. I'm being invited by students. So I'll go to U of I Champaign and talk to 50 students who are all just waiting to sign up for Greenwood because they saw their friend uh, bringing the opening bell of NASDAQ with Greenwood or doing all this stuff. Um, you know, students are very skeptical initially when they talk, you talk about the stock market and stuff like that. Again, keeping in mind, this is a, almost like a generational cycle we're trying to break, right? Um, they're the first in the family to do something like this. Uh, the ideal student for us is one who's coachable, open-minded, interested in what we're doing, up for a challenge and wants to work hard. Like we don't care about your college major. We could care less about that because we're looking for the students, like I said, who've been traditionally disconnected. They didn't pursue a career in financial services because they just don't know that it's an option for them, right? Uh, we, with a high school program, actually help students decide on a college major a lot of times because they get exposed, like I said, to so many firms. You know, we also, we also measure their social capital. How many people did you know outside your, of your immediate circle before you met us? What does it look like now, six weeks later, 10 weeks later? Your, their LinkedIn profile is growing like crazy and they're meeting more and more people who could help them in their career and stuff like that. Um, almost every student I meet, um, the words generational wealth doesn't exist where they come from, right? And the, Green, the Greenwood Project, and the name, by the way, is actually based in um, the original like, like Black Wall Street Tulsa, right? The, that story, 
because when we meet students as well, they don't know that story. They've never been, they've never heard it before. That's part of our curriculum. Let me tell you why this organization exists and what we're trying to achieve. We're actually ultimately trying to help students realize they can start building generational while starting with themselves. Now, how do we do that? We actually give them a funded brokerage account at the end of the summer. Every single kid, high school and college gets one. And they know what to do with it because they're in a stock pitch competition during the summer. They're learning how to evaluate companies. All our college students get a Bloomberg terminal every summer for the entire summer. And we underwrite the cost of the Bloomberg wow. Concepts exam. We underwrite the cost of the SIE exam for college seniors. We're working with the CFA Society of Chicago on their foundational stuff. We're building their resume, right? So for a student, not, we don't accept everybody because we understand this is not for every student. So very selective about who gets in. But the students who do get in, they start by working hard. You know, I could do, I, I'll do, I'll open up the doors for you. I'll make the connections. You got to go in there and do the work. I can't be there with you every day. So showing up on time is 99% of the job really much, you know? So um, we are very hard on them, but that's for a reason. We know what the industry is going to expect of them, you know? So again, trying to get them as prepared as possible for that. Um, as far as feeding the, the financial services pipeline, I mean, in my opinion, the pipeline doesn't really exist right now, right? Uh, retention as well is a big problem. I, I keep hearing the, uh, this people just go from like up and down LaSalle street from different firms to different firms. Right, so for us, it's like reaching as many students at an early age as possible and just giving them exposure. We're not trying to force them into financial services. We're saying spend the summer with us, meet hundreds of people, go to like, you know, 20 different firms and you might see something that connects with you. You know, we don't focus just on asset management or just on STEM. We're saying go to a Mesero or a William Blair and get exposure to everything as much as you can. And, you know, we, you know, a lot of students end up with us in sales and trading, PWM, you know, tech, HR, legal, compliance, you name it. And that makes us also very attractive to firms because we're not just saying go to this one particular area of a firm. We're saying go to a Loop Capital, understand what they do, how they make money, how you might fit in there and meet a lot of people. So I think um, our goal is to just ramp up our numbers year after year, 156 this year, 200 and plus next year and keep at one point you know, get to like five, 600 kids a year coming through our program. But uh, we need more firms. Like my biggest challenge is I need more firms. I need more Loop Capitals and more Meseros to come to the table and say, we are willing to work with you guys um, to get these students these opportunities. So I think um, the biggest challenge right now is not students. There's no lack of talent, like I said, they're out there. But we just need more companies to open up their door, their doors and, um, and in essence, what we're trying to do is just disrupt the way diversity recruiting is done for financial services. I think I'm, I'm tired of hearing the term move the needle. I think we need a new needle. We need a new system. <laughs> yeah, it just, it's not working. You know what I mean? It's, it's like, I go to all the FSP events at the Fed every year. Um, you know, but we're small, we're agile, we're moving quickly. We partner with actually a lot of the companies in the FSP directly, not through the FSP. You know, so I think, um, like, like Leo was saying, the way Mesero is doing it, where they're tying everything together, I'm no long, I don't want to have to talk to the head of DNI and then talk to the head of HR. They're not on the same page. I can't get a student an internship. Everybody needs to be on the same page. In my opinion, an employee from the employee resource group should be on the board of directors. That's just the way I feel about it. Because I feel ERGs are so critical to the recruiting and retention process. I had a conversation with Goldman Sachs and one of our students turned them down and they asked me why. I said she did not meet a black person in the entire recruitment process. So she went to a firm that she met one. And that was the decision. You know, so I think on, on the ground where I am at every day and talking to students and then getting their feedback is they want to feel welcome. They want to see people at that firm that look like them. You know, so yeah, there is a pipeline issue. We're doing our best to address it. But, you know, as we try to scale up, we just need more firms on our side. Yeah, that, that's 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 amazing stuff, Bavon, and we hope you're getting bigger and bigger as uh, as the days progress. Thank you so much. Um, let's close things out uh, with one last question for each of you. Um, what's the one piece of advice that you would give a young person in the audience today who's interested in pursuing a career in financial services industry? You know, I always like to think of what I wish I could have told my younger self. Leo, you want to start first, please? Yeah, I would tell young folks in our audience to be diligent and be persistent. These jobs are not going to come to you. You are going to have to seek them out. There are more people who want these jobs than there are supply of these jobs. And you need to work with organizations like um, Bavans and with others in order to get yourself in the pipeline. 
The other thing that I would tell them is to get all of the series, the degrees, certifications that you can. Because there's so much demand and so little supply, people are looking for reasons to throw your resume away. Don't give them a reason to do that. Constantly evolve your skill set, constantly work on your skill set, and get all of the certifications that you think you'll need in order to leverage your career going forward. Thanks so much. Greg, you want to jump in? Yes, yeah, so I, I would say, you know, voraciously exploring the world, right, to find what you're passionate about, inclusive of the financial services industry, is something that you, you should do like it's your job, right? Let your intellectual curiosity um, drive you to just dig deeper into the content that, that interests you. And ultimately, I think, you know, you'll ultimately find out, you know, what, what suits you best. And then when you do find that opportunity, you know, pursue that opportunity as, as, as hard as you can. And then as, as you know, and I'll use the financial services industry as, as a specific example. Um, and for me, you know, there are plenty of days where I felt like I was out over my skis and I felt really uncomfortable because I was new to the business. But I would say getting comfortable being uncomfortable, and stretching <laughs> yourself and putting yourself in a position that takes you outside of your comfort zone is really important in order for you to grow in this industry or, or in life in general. And then lastly, I take it back to something I said before. I mean, you know, you've got to do everything with integrity. So make sure any actions that you are taking, you know, ultimately you will be proud of yourself. Your community will be proud of you. Your family will be proud of you because making those right decisions is, is highly important and, and, and critical, especially in this day and age. Thanks, Greg. Sydney? Yeah, thanks, Greg. I think those are, are really, really great words of advice. Um, the other thing that I would add is, um, you know, is for folks to just stay connected to, um, you know, what's going on in the industry. There are a lot of ways to do that. Like you don't have to page through the Wall Street Journal every day, but, you know, the, all the, the social media uh, connectivity that young people have, there's a way to stay connected to what's going on so that you're aware of what's happening in the industry. Um, and you'll find those things that, you know, that resonate with you, whether it's about companies that, you know, that are selling the stuff that you like or whatever the case is, but, you know, find a way to stay connected to it because that's going to give you the content that you need um, to have discussions and to best position yourself um, for those opportunities and just factor that in and roll that into, you know, all the other ways that folks are staying connected, you know, with those things that they're interested in or think that they're interested in. Um, and then, you know, the other piece that I would say is just be conscious of it's never too early to start to build your network. Um, and it doesn't matter whether it's across, you know, your teachers, you know, your peers, you know, other people that you meet, you know, take that seriously. If, if, if you meet someone and they ask you to stay in touch with them, stay in touch with them. Um, it's certainly a lot easier to do that these days than when I was, you know, younger in my career where you had to pin a letter or you had to call somebody or whatever. I mean, you can do that in a really easy way um, to ping people because um, you never know what opportunities they're being asked, you know, asked about people that could, you know, work for this opportunity and you're the one that reached out to them and they can think about you for it. Um, and so I, I, you know, I think that that piece is really important because it serves you well over a really long period of time. There are people that I interface with now that I maybe met earlier in my career and we've come back together at this time because they're, you know, they're doing something and they're on the other side of me and it's an opportunity for us to connect and, and do business together or, you know, create some type of opportunities together. And so I think, you know, folks should, Never think you're too young for that to happen and to, to, to be focused on that. That's great, Sydney. Thank you. Bavon, you want to finish this out? I'm yeah. stealing all these, by the way. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people touched on, you know, things that I definitely agree with. Um, I tell all young people that, you know, opportunity doesn't go away. It just goes to the next person. So just stay ready. Right? Just always be ready. I mean, we, we stress elevator pitches with our students. You know, their resumes are always up to date. We provide all the support they need to stay ready. But, um, you know, again, it's, you know, and I, another thing I tell them is when opportunity presents itself, say, yes, I'm going to figure it out if you really want to be in this business, you know, because it is a lot of hard work, but, um, you know, stay connected to people. You know, I have, I feel like I have 350 kids on my own because my phone and email does not stop going off with all the kids that we've, we're, we're connected to. We, we describe Greenwood as a family, not a program. So they feel welcome. They feel like they belong, but, to everybody's point, you know, stay top of mind because you cannot harass me enough. 
Like you cannot email me enough. You can't call, you know, it's like, cause the other person I'm gonna think about when, when, when somebody calls and say, do you have a young person interested? Yeah, he's interested, he doesn't stop harassing me. You know, and his resume is up to date and he has an elevator pitch, he's been through our program. The other person I'm gonna remind, I'm gonna, you know, cause we're all busy, right? So, but a person that's top of mind is a person that you will refer to that opportunity. And again, it's um, a lot of our students are on this call right now, our college students from all over the country, they tuned in. They didn't have to be here, but I told them, I think it makes sense for you to be here because you might see some people and hear some things that can really affect you. And um, so Sydney, Leo, Greg, some students might be reaching out to you on LinkedIn today from Greenwood. I right? say, so, hey, I saw you on that event and and, and you, what you said was so inspirational. You know, Madam Treasurer, I, I'd like to talk, connect with you. I mean, you know, people make time for folks who are interested in, in learning more about them as well too. So I think just um, like Sydney said, it's never too early to network. That's why our young people juniors in high school attended 66 virtual events last year and they'll do more again this year. You know, so again, it's, it's, it's amazing to see how small the world has become, but you gotta find a way to find opportunity in the midst of all that's going on around you. And the students who do that are the ones who I see that really succeed and do well. Thank you, Bivan, uh, that, that's great stuff. Keep pushing them. Um, and, and thank you. Uh, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. I'm looking at my watch, we have completely blown through our hour, but that's okay by me, the discussion has been, been amazing. I think we could probably focus on this for another four hours. Uh, I wanna thank all of our panelists for being with us today. And more importantly, I wanna thank you for using your platforms and your stature to help make an impact in equity and diversity and in, in the industry. You know, your passion and commitment to the topic today was, uh, is unmistakable. Uh, so thanks also to everyone who submitted questions. Uh, they, they've just been piling in. Uh, we will get to those in writing just as soon as possible. We'll get them to the panelists. I know a lot of them were directly for the panelists, uh, but I, I, I uh, now like to turn it over to, to Treasurer Melissa Kanye Zervin for some closing comments. Thank you all. And I am going to make this quick. I know we went over time, but this was well worth our time today. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. All I can say is wow, right? And why this was so important is because, and our panelists mentioned this during the discussion. Some of them mentioned that they knew about the financial services industry, so knew when they were going to school that they would be. But a few of our panelists mentioned, you know what, I kind of accidentally got into the industry from being around some, some firms that were in it, or, or I knew some people that were in the financial industry, um, in the financial services industry, and thought that this was something I should be a part of. I think that we need to walk away today and our young people need to know that it's not never too late to join this industry. Whether you are a senior in high school, a senior in college, or have even graduated from college, it is not too late. This is a $69 trillion assets under management industry. And we certainly want to make certain that the diversity improves. And the only way for it to improve is for us to have panels as we have today. Here's the second significance and I'll close with this. The reason that we chose this panel today is because, and I think Bavon, Bavon mentioned this, our youth cannot be what they cannot see. And we wanted our young people to see people on this panel that look like them. People that are part of the financial services industry are doing well, and we want that to be an encouragement for our young people, especially the ones in the underserved community. So this is the first of many discussions we'll have. I'm happy that we were able to provide this information today. Please be certain that you follow us at chicagocitytreasurer.com where you can find out more information of panels such as this that we will have and resources that we're providing. And also, if there were questions that we were not able to answer because of the sake of time, our email address is city.treasurer at cityofchicago.com. Again, city.treasurer at cityofchicago.com. And continue to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and again, our website, chicagocitytreasurer.com. Thank you, Craig, for being not only our chief investment officer within the treasurer's office, but also being a partner for me, knowing that diversity, equity, and inclusion is personal for me, it's important for me, and we also know that it pays off. Thank you. 
the, the pleasure is certainly mine. Thank you, Madam Treasurer.